second. So let's get started. So welcome back. So the first or the second half session, we will have two tutorial on interpreting deep neural network. So I will be the third speaker. So I guess no one introduced me, so I introduce myself. So I'm, I'm Bo Lei from MIT. So I recently graduated from MIT, now a postdoc there. So I've been working on interpreting deep neural network for many years for my PhD study. So this tutorial is a summary of my previous work and uh, some latest work on this direction. So this talk is about on the importance of individual units in convolutional neural network. So deep neural network have been widely used in everywhere. So they are playing the goal that outperform our best human players. Deep neural network also making medical decisions. So after you train many medical records, the neural network can tell you whether you have tumor or not. Neural network also understanding the visual scenes, giving an input image or video. The network can precisely segment the input image into the semantic categories such as the region of the uh, door, or region of the car, the region of the person, and the rope. So neural network also widely used in visual recognition. So since 2012, AlexNet, so neural network have been widely used in visual recognition and uh, improved the state of the art performers. So a lot of different network architectures have been proposed since AlexNet, such as VGG, GoogleNet, RenderNet, or DenseLab or ACENet uh, published at the CVPR this year. So you can see people use deeper and deeper network to improve the performance. So three days ago, John played post a tweet. They said, now we can train a, a network with 10,000 layer convolutions. So it's amazing that we can train such deeper network. But the issue is, how can we understand the internal representations? So I always borrow by this question. So given so many different architectures and uh, such deeper representations, what have been learned inside? Also, what are the internal representations doing? So understanding the internal Mechani mechanism and the representation of deep neural network is also relevant to a topic, the interpretability of deep neural network or interpretability of machine learning models. So deep neural network is often criticized as a black box. So it's also criticized as a magic box. Or giving an input image can give you such human level predictions without any reasonings. So the interpretability of neural network is also relevant to some on topics such as it's relevant to the safety of AI models. So when we deploy the AI models in such critical applications such as autonomous drivings, of course we want to make sure the models doing reasonable things. So we don't want the AI models kill people. So the interpretability is also relevant to the trust of AI decisions. Let's say this AI model tell you you have a cancer, so how much confidence or trust you can put on those AI medical diagnosis. The interpretability is also re relevant to the policy and the regulation. For example, the GDPR regulation issued by European Union recently have items that the common people have the right to the explanation for any algorithmic decision. So basically, you have to provide some explanation for the algorithmic decisions if you want to deploy the AI models. The interpretability is also a controversial topic. So in NIPS last year, when Ali Rahimi gave a test of tie, a war talk, he charged that current machine learning algorithms in which computers learn through trail and arrows have became, become a form of alchemy. So alchemy is good. Alchemy works. However, alchemy lacks the rigorous proof or theoretic justifications. So you know, when that, whenever there is a controversy, there will be someone um, post a tweet. So Yang Liquan posted a tweet here. So he responds to Ali Rahimi said the calling of current machine learning at alchemy is uh, insulting, so it's wrong. So here, there is another interesting symposium at NIPS last year, the Interpretable Machine Learning Symposium. So there is a debate session on if interpretability necessary. So at Foresight, there is a Rich Carola and Patrick Simot, which are, uh, who are senior researchers from Microsoft Research. So the guest side is uh, Kaden Weberg, who is a professor from Cornell, and also, of course, Yang Li Kun. So they debate on if the interpretability is necessary. So it's a very interesting debate. So 
So you can click the link and uh, watch this debate. So in this debate, Yang Li Kuang gave a very interesting analogy that so when common people watch TV or drive a car, you don't necessarily understand how the TV or car works. However, but when the car or TV broken, you need someone that know what's going on there to fix the car or TVs. So I still the debate, the, the, the interpretability is very necessary and important. So understanding the new network could be at a different generality depends on the level of detail. So here is a diagram of deep neural network. So giving an input image, there are several layers of convolution. So give you the final outputs, so which category this image belongs to. So each layer is doing convolution, this is crystal clear. But since it's getting messy when you train that network on millions of training samples, so it's getting difficult to understand what have been learned inside. So to understand the network, we can understand the whole network as a whole. So people propose different network architectures. They want to improve the final performers or they want to prevent the overfitting issues. So we also can understand the network from the feature space, feature level. So people use testing proposed by Lawrence there to visualize uh, how features become more and more discriminative over the layers and how those features can be used for some transfer learning or some other visual recognition task. So understanding neural network also could be at the individual unit level. So for each convolution filters or units, we want to understand what have been learned for them and what each individual is doing. So for this tutorial, I will mainly focus on the last part to understand what those individual units doing. Hope we can, if we can better understand those individual units, those are basically elements of the common net. We can, be, we can better understand the behaviors of the network. So here is the outline of my tutorial. I will mainly address three questions. So the first question is, what is a unit doing? So if we want to understand the behavior of one unit, so we can visualize them. So the second question I want to address is, what are all the units doing? So if we want to understand all the units in a layers or in a whole network, so we need to have some quantitative metric to get the interpretation and then compare the different units. So I will show you that we propose some recent method to, to associate interpretation for each one of the units automatically. So the third question I want to address is how the units are relevant to the final prediction. So there are a lot of interpretable units emerge inside the re representations. How is it relevant to the final prediction? Whether they contribute more to the fi final predictions compared to the non-interpretable units. So lastly, I will move from the interpretable unit to explainable model to show you how can we build better explainable models by leveraging the in interpretable units. So I will also talk about some future directions. So the first thing is how can we get uh, deep representations? So people train network on those image net or places for supervised learning. So we can get a deep representation from those supervised learning, the network train down image net for object classification or network train down places for scene recognition. We also can get a deep representation from self-supervised learning. So recently people proposed different self-supervised learning methods to get the representation. So basically they train a network without use image labels so for example, they propose some context prediction task. So each time they train the network to predict the uh, neighborhood relations of the two patches. Also people, per, people propose uh, those colorization tasks. They train a network to colorize a gray image into color image. Use this as a supervision to train the network. Also per, people use audio predictions to train the network to predict the correspondence between the video frame and audios. So those different supervisions, you can get the different representations. So after you get uh, so many different deep representations, what you can do to understand them. So first thing you can try is to visualize them. So what is a unit doing? So you can simply visualize a unit. So there are a lot of previous work to visualize the internal representation. So for example, the deconvolution is a way to visualize the deep representation. Basically they show that the unit at the lower layer, such as layer two, the, those units are doing um, age or texture detections. Those units at the higher layer, such as layer five, are detecting more semantic meaningful concept, such as uh, the dog head or bicycle wheels. 
So the back propagation is also a very popular way to visualize the internal knowledge. So they generate the gradient to modify the image, and they can back project their learning the knowledge uh, in image space. Also recently, people use some image synthesis method to visualize the internal units or final units. So basically, they train a generative model that can generate an image that maximizes the activations um, of the unit activation, the final activations. So by the way, the, all the tutorial video and the slide will be put on our website. So you don't have to take photos of this slide. <laughs> yeah. So here I will mainly cover two visualization approach. So the first approach is a gradient based uh, visualization. So basically you, you iteratively use gradients to optimize an image that activates a particular unit. So here I show you some screenshots of the modified images at different optimization stage. So you can see gradually the gradients will help generate some image that maximize activation of a unit. So you can do the things for different units. So let's say if we do the uh, gradient visualization for those units at the lower layer, they will generate some textures. You, you see those units at the lower layer and they capture the textures. So those units at higher layer detect those objects, different those eyes, and some dog head there. So another visualization approach is a data-driven visualization or sample-based visualization. So basically giving any network representation. So we propel a test set. So this is a set of testing images hold out from the training set. So you feed those images inside the network then record activation of each unit for each one of the image. Let's say we want to visualize three units um, at layer five. Then we can simply rank those top act, uh, rank all the images by the unit activation. Then we get the top activated images. Let's say here are the top activated images for unit one, because for each one of the image, the unit will generate a feature map. Then we can binarize the feature map, then upsample to the original image. Then we can further segment the top activated images into local regions. So those local region will better visualize what pattern have been captured by this unit. So you can see for this particular unit, they capture the lamp patterns. So we can do the similar things for all the other units. So here are the top activated images for unit two, simply detecting the face. So here are the top activated images for another unit, unit three. This unit seems selective to uh, trade marks. So here I release this uh, visualization tool at uh, this GitHub rib, Git, GitHub rib. So if you're interested, you can download and play with them or visualize your unit. So here is a comparison of the two visualization. So each column shows a visualization for one unit from the data-driven visualization and the gradient-based visualization. So from this comparison, we can see it seems uh, the data-driven visualization can get, give you better intuition what have been learned for that unit. So by looking at uh, the visualization, it, you may come up with different interpretation. So the, the question become, how can we better interpret each unit? For, for example, for the first unit, you may say the interpretation is a baseball, or it may just capture the stripes pattern. For the second unit, it may capture the clouds. It also may capture the fluffiness. For the third unit, it detecting the dog face, or maybe it's selective to snows. So it's hard to come up with the uh, interpretation. So right now the issue is how can we compare different units? Also, how can we interpret all the, all the units? So the first thing I try is to manually annotate each unit. It's how we annotate the individual image. So basically, we send the top activated images to Amazon Mechanical Turk. Then we ask the workers to come up with some descriptions to summarize the, the patterns. Then we ask them to cross out the outliers. Through that, we can estimate how accurate the unit detects some patterns. So for this particular unit, it detects a lamp. So we do the annotation for all the units. So here is a histogram of the object detectors annotated from the camera file of AlexNet trained down ImageNet. So here's a histogram. You can see the most frequent detector, object detector is a dog detector. That's because in ImageNet, there are out of the 1,000 object categories, there are about 
more than 200 dog categories. So there are a lot of dog detectors. Those units specialize to detect different dog. So we do the interpretation for uh, an annex net trained on scratch on places. So out of the 256 units, there are more than 150 units associated as uh, object detectors. So compare the two representation, you can see the two network builds completely different set of representations to represent the input data. So the representation really have the semantic meaning and they, they really depend on what kind of data you feed into the network. So this interpretation is only done on AlexNet. So AlexNet is already five years old. It only have five layers, about 1,000 units. Right now, people use much deeper networks such as ResNet or DenseNet. So it's impossible to manually annotate the individual units. So we need to come up with some automation to scale up the interpretation to deeper network. So at the, at the CVPR last year, we proposed a technique called network dissection. So basically, it's a general framework to quantify the interpretability of network. So you can consider this as a toolkit. So you can throw any kinds of network trained for visual recognition insights. Then this network dissection will help you identify this interpretable unit. It will also help you evaluate the interpretability of some layers for the network. So here we define the interpretability as a degree of alignment between the unit activation and the, a concept in our dictionary. So how it works? The idea is actually pretty simple. We just evaluate the individual units for semantic cementation. So rather than annotate each individual unit, we first uh, prepare testing data sets. So this te testing data set ha has 60,000 images annotated with 1,200 concepts. So right now we can generate the top activated images for one unit, showing as an example. Now for the segment, use the feature map. Here, because for each one of the testing images, we have such pixel-wise annotations. So here, each pixel have a semantic label showing you the labels of that pixel, such as this bath, lamp, or ceiling, or floors. Then we can further use a feature map to segment the annotation mask. Right now, we can simply count how many ground truth pixels have been segmented by the unit, then associate the top confident labels as the interpretation for that unit. So for this particular unit, the top concept uh, is a lamp, so the interpretation giving, uh, given to this uh, unit is a lamp. So we further use uh, intersection over union to measure the, the accuracy of that unit. So basically, we take the detected region and the ground truth region and divide by the union of the two regions. So basically, this number provides us uh, some quantitative metric to, uh, to estimate how accurate this in interpretation is associated with the concept. So we apply the network dissection on a baseline network. So here is the AlexNet trained down places. So the on common five layers. So out of the 256 units, there are more than 100 units covering 72 unit concepts. So we have 22 object detector, 16 detectors, and another uh, 25 texture detectors. So here are some examples. So here's one unit, unit 79, the interpretation given by network dissection. Is a car, so it's a car detector. So the IOU is 0.13. So here's another unit, so unit 107. The so interpretation given by uh, our, the network dissection is a rope, so it's a rope detector. So the IOU is 0.15. So we can use this network dissection to compare different representations. So we apply network dissections to those different models, AlexNet, VGG, GoogleNet, ResNet, train down different data sources, such as ImageNet and places. So here I show you some examples. So here is a object detector, the house detector in AlexNet, in VGG, in GoogleNet, in ResNet. So you can see the IOU of the house detectors keep increase, so you get a better and better um, house detectors when you use deeper network. Also, the house detector in GoogleNet or ResNet can detect a more compact house compared to the house detector for AlexNet. So here is another airplane detector in AlexNet, in VGG, in GoogleNet, in ResNet. So IOU of those airplane detectors also keep increase. So you get a pretty nice airplane detectors in GoogleNet and ResNet. 
So also the air plant detector in ResNet even can handle some change of a scales case. You can see the uh, air plant detectors and detect the air plant in different scales. Also, it can handle some occlusion case. There is a person standing in front of the air plant, still can detect them. So if we can annotate those internal units, then we can do object detections and the scene classification in a single forward pass. So we can further compare uh, the interoperability of different network trained on different sources. So here is a plot showing the use a number of unique interpretable concept detectors emerge across all these different architectures in AlexNet, VGG, GoogleNet, RenNet, trained down on image and places. So basically you have deeper network, you get a more number of interpretable units. So it really depends on how many um, filters you include for the layers. Also we found out that there are more interpretable units emerge from the network trained down places compared to ImageNet. So here I would like to further highlight some recent work towards this direction. So for example, here is a recent work done by Fong and uh, Vardadi from Oxford Universities. So they have been looking at how concepts are encoded by a set of filters. So this plot showing you that as the number of filters increase, the IOU of the segmentations also keep increase. So after you include about um, 30 or 40 units, the performers kind of saturated. So it shows that the information of semantics may be only encoded by a group of, a limited group of filters. So here in another CVPR uh, work uh, at, uh, published at the CVPR this year. So researchers Zhang Wu Zhu from UCLA, so they are looking at how to improve the interpretability of units. So pre previously we proposed we can accurately measure the interpretability. So the nature next step is how can we improve that? So they propose some training technique. They put a loss function from then each of those individual filters. Then they can better improve their interpretabilities over the training process. So I would like to look into another relevant question. So how the interpretable units relevant to the final prediction? So from the previous work, we see that there are a lot of interpretable units emerge from the network trained for visual recognition. However, how they relevant to the final prediction, whether they contribute more or less than the long run in interpretable unit. So recently, DeepMind has, has a iClear paper this year. So they have done some ablation experiments. So basically they remove one unit in a network, then observe how this damage to the final classification. So here's the network. So the classification accuracy is about 85%. So let's say we remove one unit, then the performance on overall classification accuracy drop to 80%. Then we can see the importance of that unit is 5%. Then we can use this number as a quanti quantitative measure for, for the unit importance. Right now, we can either remove the interpolo easy to interpret units, or either to remove the confusion units. So easy to interpret units are those units that are selective to some patterns, such as a cat, or those confusion units are, seems to respond to random patterns. So they can try to remove different units and see how it affects the classification. So here is uh, their results. So here for each dot is a unit from a uh, ResNet trained down image net. The horizontal axis is a uh, uh, unit interpretability. So they define the interpretability as a, as a class selectivity, like how units is selective to some classes. So they use this as a metric for the unit interpretability. So for the vertical axis is uh, importance of that unit. So they use a uh, um, dropping validation loss before and after the unit ablation. So they use uh, validation, uh, the difference in validation loss as a measure for the unit importance. So basically this plot showing you that there is pretty weak or no correlation between the unit interpretability and the unit importance. So the, you can see the correlation, the R is uh, close to zero. So to get uh, this conclusion, the CAT unit may be more interpretable, but they are not more important. So they further have some claims in the paper. This is that it implies that method for understanding new network based on analyzing highly selective single units may be misleading. So 
when I first came across the paper, I'm pretty upset because I spent so many years of my PhD study chasing this topic. So you see, this is misleading. It says my PhD is mislead. <laughs> so however, I just graduated uh, last month, so it's really <laughs> not my business. So however, I still upset by this. So I went back and repeat all the experiments. So I found out it is indeed the case the no matter how interpretable the unit is, the damage to the overall classification is almost the same. But however, I found something interesting. I found out that if you remove one unit, the damage to the class accuracy is very significant. So here is the example. So here the, from the visualization of this unit, this unit seems selective to the bat. So if we remove this unit, then we can compute the class accuracy job for all the classes. Then we can rank all the classes by their class accuracy job. So we can see the top damaged class are the bad relevant classes, just, such as uh, use, hostels, bad rules, bad champers. So here I show you some sample images from the top three damaged classes. So for the use hostel, the damage is uh, for the class accuracy job is a uh, 24%, so for the bad rule, so if you remove this unit, the damage is 50%. For the bad chambers, the job is 30%. So it clearly shows that this unit is very important to recognize the subset of categories. So what's more interesting is that we observe that some classes actually benefit from this unit removal. So if you remove this unit, their class accuracy actually improve a little bit. So we take a look at this categories, but there are some random categories. So here's another example. So we remove this unit uh, from the AlexNet trained down image net. So from the visualization, we can see this unit is uh, selective to well. So if we remove this unit, some of the classes have been damaged a lot for their class accuracy. So you can see here I show you some examples for the top three damaged class. So the Model T, their class accuracy damaged more than 40%. For the bicycle build for two, the damage more than 30%. For the unicycles, the damage is 50%. So you can see this unit is really important for the network to recognize those categories, those bicycle relevant categories. So if we remove this unit, this network cannot recognize those, those wheels clearly than they, they have do very bad performance on those categories. So we can, for each one of the units, we can generate the sorted class accuracy job. Right now, we can take the max class accuracy job for each one of the units and uh, use that number as a metric to measure how important that unit to some specific classes. So for all the units at one layers, we can plot them. So here I sort, so horizontal axis is a sorted unit by their cl max class accuracy job. So you can see for some of those units, the damage to the class accuracy is very significant, it's more than 50%. For some of the classes, the damage is about 10%. So here in this curve, I also plot the overall accuracy job. So you can see no matter what unit you remove, the, the overall accuracy job keep flat. So we further can visualize the, the unit with different max class accuracy job. So here are the units with the largest max class accuracy job. So they are detecting the waterfall, or, or the second one detects the windmills. So those units have been very selective some, to some spef specific objects. So here I show you some an, another two units with the least max class accuracy job. So those units have least damage to the class accuracy. So for those two units, we can see this seems selective to some textures. So texture could be shared across all the different categories. So when you remove them, so the damage to the class is not that significant. So because there are some other units maybe detecting those textures. So we further compute the correlations. So the horizontal axis is a class selectivity. So basically there's a definition for the deep mind people uh, for their interpretability. The vertical axis is the overall accuracy job. So you can see there is a pretty weak correlation between the two. So this is just uh, re reproduce the DeepMind paper's results. So no matter how interpretable unity is, the uh, uh, damage to the overall accuracy is almost the same. So however, here we further 
compute the correlation between the class selectivity and the max class accuracy job. So correlation is very significant. It's a, about 0.2 correlations, which means the more interpretable unit is. If you remove them, you will have higher damage to the class, to some of the classes. So we have further done some greedy removal experiments. So we can select one class, then keep remove the unit to reduce the class accuracy for that class. So we can see the accuracy drop very quickly. So for each one of the class. So when you remove about 10 units or 15 units, the class accuracy job already dropped to 10%, which means the, to recognize some specific class, the information is only encoded by a limited number of units. If you remove completely lock out those units, then this network cannot recognize those category anymore. So we have some other experiments to evaluate how those different regularizers affect the representation. So basically we put, we evaluate batch normalization and the job out, how they affect the representation. So here we have the baseline, the AlexNet trained on ImageNet. So for the baseline, we put a batch norm on, on top of the baselines. For, for each one of the convolution layers, we put a batch normalization there. So we found out that the batch normalization actually reduce the class information encoded by each, each unit. It seems to shuffle the class information a little bit across all the units. So we further put a channel dropout on the common five unit of baseline model. So it's a little bit different to the normal dropout. The channel dropout is that each time about 50% of the channel or unit will, will be dropout during the training process. So the overall accuracy um, is, a, is a little bit worse, like two or three percent worse if we add this channel job out on camera five. But when, you draw, when we put this channel job out on the camera five layers, we can see from this orange curve, it shows that this channel job out completely shuffled inf information about the class across all the units. Which means if we put the regularizer there, it scatter the information across all the units. So it's forced the network doing the distributed coding for each one of the class. So from this result, we can see the dropouts reduce, uh, greatly scatter the class information across all the units. Also the different regularizers can affect the interoperability of the network. So you may see there may be some trade-off along the performers and the interoperability and the robustness of, of the network. That's because previously when people think proposing or designing the regularizers such as batch norm job outs, they only focus on to improve the performance or the overfitting issue of the network. So we, here we show that you also maybe can propose some regularizers can improve the interoperability of the network. At the same time, you can preserve the performance. So that will be one of the future directions. How can you have better regularizers to do the trade-off along the attributes of the network. So we further apply network dissection on the three network, then we observe that the job outs greatly reduce the number of interpretable units emerged inside the network. So now I, I, want, I would like to move from interpretable units to explainable AI models, because explainable AI model is a very important topic. So giving a prediction, or we always want to give some explanations why this network gives such prediction. Let's say for this particular image, it's predicted as cafeteria, so why is that? So ideally, we want to generate some human understandable uh, explanations such as because there is a, this is cafeteria because there are many persons, chairs, tables, plates, and cups here that classify as cafeteria. So to generate explanation, there are some previous work the, so here is the ECCV work two years ago that they use a, a language model, so it's a recurrent explanation generator model to generate explanation for some, some deep fine-grained classification model. So they can generate some explanations for the classification models. However, I feel this more is more like you using another black box to explain the behaviors of black box, maybe the two black box doing something wrong. So ideally, we want to do some self-explanation. 
So here I'll show you some example, because right now, if each unit is selective to some, some patterns, then we can associate the uh, interpretation for each one of the units. Now for this prediction, the network tell, tell us there's a walk in the dock, then we can simply rank the activation of the unit and get the top three highly activated units. Then we just generate explanations from their interpretation of units. Because this unit is detecting a dog, lag, person, this image is classified as a walk in the dock. So we can further use this to analyze the failure case of the network to give you this for this image, it's classified as cutting vegetables, the label is gardening. Then we generate the top activated images. So from the interpretation of the unit, we can see the second unit seems confuse the background, the, the paviyard rope as a table. So it's classified as cutting the vegetables. So if we can have better interpretable units, then we can build better explainable models to generate more reliable explanations for the network without using any external modules. So this is the ideal future goals. So there are some other future directions relevant to the interpretable deep learning, such as we care about generalization and overfittings. So the representation definitely is relevant to how these representations can be generalized or shared across different visual tasks. It's also relevant to the defend and attack by the adversary samples, because for fully transparent or interpretable models, there shouldn't be those adversary samples that easily fool the network. So the interpretability also can be used for network compression. So we can use this as a metric to prove out the filters and only keep those filters that are relevant to the final predictions. And then we can do network compressions. So it's also relevant to the plasticities and the transfer learnings, how those the features can be generalized to other our visual recognition task. So also, we want to look in, looking beyond the classification models, and we can interpret the generative models or deep reinforcement learning models to make those models more interpretable. So I would like to conclude my tutorial talk with this question, so why we care about interpretability. Because we want to move from the alchemy of deep learning to the chemistry of deep learning by putting those scientific understandings, there's more theoretic justifications. So I believe with such joint efforts, we can build better, safer, and trustful models and more transparent AI models. So this is the end of my tutorial. Thank you. So any questions? I have I have two related questions. One is, I didn't get a sense for how scalable what you have been doing is. It seems like you are carefully manually <coughs> examining a lot of things uh, as the number of concepts really uh, scales up how your network dissection, how easy will it be to evaluate uh, the network dissection? That's, that was not very clear to this question one. Mm -hmm. The associated question is that there's a lot of, these concepts are not particularly independent of each other, right? Like a dog is more similar to a cat than it is to a doorknob. So I would expect that there might even be some interplay between these units in that manner because of correlations across the concepts. Mm -hmm. So that might give you some way of managing the overall scale as it were. Yeah, so for your second second question, there's a correlation. So, yeah, it's, it's indeed the case. So those concepts have some relations. So we can use a uh, unit activation actually to understand the correlations between those, those co relations between the concepts. I think that's one of the applications of this work. So you can do the other way around. Right, right now we just associate a label for each concept. Then you also can associate the relationship of the concept use uh, unit activations. So I think that's a, uh, interesting directions. So relevant to your first question, so how network dissection scalable to scalable to to other tasks, right? So that's because network dissection is an automatic uh, way to interpret the units. So basically you can have any training in the network. So you can just throw this to network dissection. It can help you automatically identify the units. So you don't have to manually annotate each each one of the individual units. 
But there are some limitations there, of course, so because it limits um, to interpret the concept in our dictionary. So because our dictionary only have uh, 1,200 concepts. So we have some ongoing work to include more concepts that we can, we can interpret you know, wider concept detectors. Yeah, thank thank you, you for your question. Thank you. Um, so for your exploration of removing single units to see how it affects your classification accuracy, um, did you notice any correlation between the depth of the network and how many units you had to say remove before you lost all your accuracy? Yeah, that's a good question. So here, I mainly focus on the last convolution layer. So we also look at the previous layer. We found out that the previous layer are less specified to some class accuracy. So which means they are more generalizable features. So at a later stage, at a later convolution layer, they become more and more specialized to detect some class. Basically, their class selectivities become higher. So if you remove them, so the damage to some class will be more significant. Um, so it was always around like 10 to 15 from AlexNet to ResNet if you're always looking at the last layer. It was always about the same number. Yeah, it's different. It really depends on the architecture. So right now we put uh, this paper on archive, so we mainly look at the AlexNet with five convolution layers. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. First, uh, first, thank you for your talk. And uh, uh, I have a question. So how do we evaluate the... Um, <laughs> The, the interpretability method. So, so if, if a network makes a wrong prediction and there's an explanation uh, that explains why it makes that mistake. So how do we know the explanation is, is right? So how, if that explanation is, is wrong, then yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. So it's relevant to Bing Kane's talk. So like how can we better evaluate the interpretability and the interpretations? So she mentioned that we can use a human to annotate them. So we also have some ongoing work that we just sent the explanation to Amazon Mechanical Turk. So we ask them how re reliable those representation is. So how understandable or interpretable to human beings. Through that, we can better, better evaluate those interpretations. Thank you. Hi. Uh, the que I, I have my question is: Is there a tool or an automatic way of deciding which particular element to get rid of or not? Because overall accuracy is pre remaining pretty much the same, but certain classes are getting more affected versus the other. So. Uh, is it, because you know, you, you, you talked about it, you gave examples, but mm -hmm. is there an automatic tool to? Yeah, yeah, I think you can use a class accuracy as a metric to show how important this unit is relevant to some classes. Let's say you only want the accuracy, high accuracy for some of the classes, have low accuracy for some of other classes. Then you can use a job in class accuracy to remove the units. So we will try to release the codes um, quickly. Yeah. So All you right. can use to All prove right. Network. No, uh, uh, it's a slightly more general question. The question is that, like, when you uh, get a network and then you want to further sort of reduce the complexity, uh, I'm going in that direction and see. Let's say you know, like, we have certain accuracy that we, we we go and say you know we have so much accuracy for this network. Now I start removing stuff. Overall accuracy doesn't doesn't drop, and so. The second network and the first network, which was, they are different because the second network has now has less number of elements, but uh, overall accuracy is about the same. But then the question is that uh, how would one compare that with the other? Because is it because there are so many elements? Uh, you know, you'll have a combinatorial explosion if you're trying to do exhaustive search to figure out which one to remove and which one is not. That's why I'm asking the question. Is there a systematic way of finding out which one to keep and which one to remove? Yeah, I think that's relevant to the redundancy in the network. Right. So I think the from the researcher doing network compressions, they, they just try, I think the most popular metric they use is just the L1 norm of the filters. You simply take the L1 norm and remove the units, so uh, it's like less uh, effect. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. No, I understand. I mean, the L1 norm is an old trick. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have applied that in signal processing, compressive sensing for a long time, but mm -hmm. it's being applied now for L1 regularization. Mm -hmm. 
but that's just a, yeah, but anyway, I, I think you get the picture. I'm looking for if there's a systematic way to sort of like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would be the future direction. Uh, hi, uh, uh, you mentioned the contradiction between the uh, DeepMind paper and your discovery. Could you uh, explain a little bit about the uh, relative flats uh, drop, the overall accuracy drop, uh, and the uh, versus uh, contrast to the interpretability? So Why there is actually happen? no contradiction. It's just that DeepMind people don't look at uh, class accuracy. They only look at the overall accuracy. So yeah. we just uh, reproduce their result, showing you that no matter how interpretable unit is, the damage to the overall accuracy is almost the same. It's a drop about like 0.1 or 0.2%. However, we further look into the class accuracy. So we found out some of the units actually specialize to recognize some of the classes. So they're more selective to the classes. If you will remove them, then you have heavy damage to, to the classes. So Just as those two results are complementary to each other, I think. It's not contradiction. I think it's contradictory because uh, if uh, this influence only focus on some uh, this or that uh, classes, uh, the overall accuracy should, should be just the uh, influence on that max uh, influence divided by 1,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you'll, fi you'll find that it's not just the max influence divided by 1,000 it added some other uh, changes so that, uh, so that it's, it is not correlated with the interpretability. Um, sorry about my... Yeah, I think we can, we can chat okay. later right, off stage. So, okay, so let's work on our next oh, yeah, question. One last question. Okay. Uh, so this is related to your question to, to Kim earlier is um, how do you think this you know, t interpretability of the units can improve the model. And, um, you know, I have a specific use case. So, for example, the zebra stripes like um, images, um, if we wanted, if, if we can identify those units identifying the stripes versus units identifying the color, can, is there a way to, you know, emphasize those units that, you know, identify stripes uh, to kind of direct the model to the direction that we want? this to, to perform, like mm -hmm. in, in a systematic way? <laughs> yeah, I think that's an interesting question. So we found those stripe detectors in, in a network. So our method can detect those texture, stripe texture detectors. So if you can annotate the units, then you can use the activation of that unit to build some explanation for the zebra classification maybe. Maybe we can talk about, uh, I got that you can use ablation to reduce the accuracy. I didn't get it. How do you improve the accuracy using that, you know, emphasizing that mm. unit? Okay, so yeah, we can talk, talk about it. Okay, thanks. All right, so, so our last speaker is Andrew Vidadi. So Andrew is a social professor at uh, Oxford University. So Andrew, I think Andrew is best known for the very useful libraries he released, such as v VR Fit, Computer Vision Libraries, and the Math Commonet. Even I'm using them quite often. So thanks for your contribution to this open source community. So Andrew have done a lot of interesting work on deep learning applications or also understanding the deep feature representations. So let's work on Professor Andrew Vidadi. Thank you. <clears throat> I just hope to get as many questions as you've got. So let's see. Um, all right. So before we were saying that uh, uh, we are interested in uh, models which are black boxes and we like to understand them. They don't necessarily need to be uh, deep networks, but well, let's face it. What we're really interested in are uh, deep networks. So we train a model like, uh, in this case, AlexNet, and that model takes an image like that, and that goes through uh, several layers of processing and eventually comes up with an answer that's a gold finch. Now, of course, this is great, but uh, we don't, do not really understand what all those layers in the middle of the architecture are actually doing. So there are a bunch of questions that we may be interested in asking. First of all, we might be wanting to know <clears throat> what is the model actually doing. What, so we have trained the model and want to know what the model has learned to do. So of course, it has learned to recognize gold finches, but maybe it also has recon learned to recognize the parts of the birds and uh, uh, Boulay's talk was in fact quite uh, informative in this regard. But then we may also want to know how the model does that. So one thing is to know whether the model understands objects and their parts. Another thing is to understand how the model comes up 
uh, with a recognition of those uh, concepts and, or uh, semantic entities in the image. And eventually, and maybe that's the hardest quest question, is how does the model learn to do those things if you just give uh, it images and some image level labels? Okay, so there are many interesting things that we might want to know about these models. Today, um, just as my colleagues have done, I'm gonna focus in particular on the first question. So what does do this model learn to do once you have trained them, okay? So again, here's our deep network. The deep network at the end of the day can be uh, interpreted just as a function. In fact, it's a sequence of functions. So you can cut the network, slice it at any layer, and the network will map your image X onto some uh, tensor Y, uh, which uh, we don't need to call a tensor, we can just call a vector for the purpose of this presentation. And we call that subnetwork uh, that goes from the image um, onto Y as phi, okay? And the network, of course, contains a sequence of those functions, but we can also study one of them at a time. Not just the last layer, but in, in fact, each individual intermediate layer as well. So if you look at this in this way, we uh, see that the network is just a map that takes an image as input that's just uh, a vector which lives in some n-dimensional or m-dimensional uh, vector space and maps that into a code which is another vector into some n-dimensional vector space where m and n in general have different dimensionality, okay? And uh, we don't really know what the function does. We have, it's a black box and we would like to probe it to tease apart the features of this function. So we're gonna talk about three themes. Um, in fact, probably two because I don't think there is time to do the third. Um, the first one is generating iconic, iconic example, second one is attribution, and the third one is semantic identification. So I'm gonna start from the first one, generating iconic examples. What do we mean by that? Well, let's see. So here, that's my black box function. Again, goes from the image space onto some code space and map each image onto a code, okay? Now, the first question I would like to answer here is how much information does my code Y contain about contains, uh, contain about X, okay? So how can I answer that question? How can I get a sense of the information that Y has about the input? Well, what I can do is to look for other images that happen to map onto the same code. So why do I think that there should be more than one image that map onto the same Y? Well, if you think about it, this is pretty obvious at the very end of your network because the last layer of your network is producing a thousand dimensional vector of class probabilities, okay? So in theory, that code should only tell you about the label of the image, and therefore all the goldfinches say they have to map onto the same code Y, which is the code that stands for goldfinch, okay? So we know that networks are designed essentially to build up invariance as you go from the image onto your semantic space. So clearly these should not be expected to be injective functions, and therefore you're gonna have several images which map to the same code. Now what you're gonna do, nevertheless, is going to look at the problem of inverting this non-injective function. So what I wanted to come up with is phi to the minus one, but of course I cannot do that point by point. Uh, the, the result of phi to, phi to the minus one is gonna be a set, a set we, which we call pre-image of y, according to phi, okay? And uh, that set will contain all the images that are essentially identical from the viewpoint of the network. Why? Because they map according to the network phi onto the same code, all right? So we want to have a characterization of that set of images or equivalence class of images that are for the network indistinguishable. So how, do I, how can I come up with a characterization of that? Well, I'm not going to propose to list or, um, you know, completely, exhaustively explore that space, but at least what we can do quite easily is to come up with a sampling of that space. So how can we do that? Well, a very simple method is to just start from random noise that thing X1 there at the bottom left. And then we set up an optimization problem in which we compare the code phi X0, which is our reference image, the ones from which we compute the code Y, the code uh, uh, that we get instead by applying that uh, net deep neural network onto the noise image, which is phi X, and then uh, we minimize that quantity using stochastic gradient descent. All right, that's gonna pull my code Y to be the same for the image X0 and X1, and uh, in the process of doing that, it's gonna pull um, my random noise image onto the set of uh, pre-images of the function. So I can get a, a sample out of that set. All right, that's the idea. Very simple. Now, if I do that in a sort of uh, trivial way, actually this doesn't work very well. Why? Well, let's see. So I start with this problem of sampling my natural image, my pre-image set. 
And the first image you get is this. That's actually a real example from AlexNet converting some uh, deep layer of it. Now, you can sort of see that there is a shape there, maybe. I mean, the project is not very clear, but there is some, somehow a shadow, but it's very, very unclear. However, if you do this, if you restrict your inversion to be on the spaces of natural images, and what is the space of natural image? That's the image, images that you're actually likely to capture if you go around the world and start shooting, uh, pointing your camera at, at random objects, okay? So if you restrict your inversion problem to the set of natural images, then chances are that your inversion is gonna be much, much clearer, okay? Now, which one is better? Well, in, the, in one sense, in order to get to the uh, second result that I showed there, we need to constrain uh, the inversion process, and we need to constrain it by adding the information about what is a natural image. Now, is this bad or good? Well, we're gonna discuss this later in further detail, but let's just say that a deep network is not trained to operate on anything which is not a natural image. Why? Because when you train a deep network, you only show it images of the sort that you see there on the bottom left. You never show, show, you never show net, the network an image, it's just the one on the bottom right. So there is some sense into trying to restrict your inversion to images that are actually visible to the network during training because being a discriminatory model, the network doesn't need to be well defined for uh, well, outside that space. So we want to do that restriction, but actu that actually in practice is quite hard. So what we're gonna do is to come up with a, what I call a pseudo natural image. So we're gonna impose some constraint on uh, this inversion problem that is encouraging the image to look, like, to look natural, but is not uh, perfect. Just because be, uh, constraining the network to, be, to invert onto nat natural image space is just very, very hard. So how can we do that? Well, there are a bunch of ways we can try to approach the problem. One is just to add a regularizer to our energy function, say the, the TV norm. We could just constrain the space of inversions to be in an interesting image uh, space, denoted there with uh, XPN, pseudo natural. Or maybe we can model the distribution of natural images as a probability distribution, and then doing some sort of conditional posterior probability sampling from that. And that's also possible and interesting. But I'm going to focus in particular on the uh, central box there, so constrained optimization. And I want to discuss a interesting method of sampling the space of natural images that we discovered recently, which is actually rather bizarre, okay? So this is a, a call deep image prior. We're presenting the paper here at CVPR, and so we're gonna give you a sneak peek of what that is. So the idea is almost straightforward. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a generator network, like the one I'm showing there, so that goes through a, through a bunch of convolutional and deconvolutional layers, and I'm not going to train that. It's not trained at all. So what I'm gonna do is to use the parameters of the network, which are the parameters of the filters, as a parameterization of my image, okay? So you're gonna look at the network as a parameterization of the image, where the parameters are just the numbers that you plug into the filters. There's also an input vector there, which is called Z0, that is also randomized and fixed, so that I never change. Okay, so this, there is no training whatsoever in here. The only thing that I'm setting is the structure of that network. Okay, you might wonder, well, what's the meaning of doing that? Well, let's see what is the meaning of this. So suppose uh, now I want to solve a very simple problem, reconstruction, okay? So what I do is I take an image X and I want to find the parameters of network W that cause that generator to reconstruct that, that single example point X, all right? So I'm going to do a point-wise reconstruction of a single image. And to do that, I'm going to fit, a net, I could fit this network using stochastic gradient descent as usual. Now if the image looks natural, then uh, the convergence is actually quite fast. But as I add more noise to my input image, then the convergence of this process is actually slower and slower. So what does that mean? It means that this parameterization of the image is just high impedance to noise. It likes to fit data which looks natural. It does not, it does not like to fit data which looks like noise, okay? That's all. Is that powerful? Again, so the convergence speed of this is proportional to how natural an image looks. Is that powerful? Actually, it turns out that this is surprisingly powerful. So here, I'm going to use that for in painting. So what does it mean? It means I take an image like the one on the top left there, for which half the pixels are missing. And then I'm going to fit the, the remaining pixels using this deep image prior that is to say using this parameterization of the image to reconstruct, to do, to, uh, well, parameterize my reconstruction, and then I'm going to optimize, minimize that quantity using SGD, 
and this is what I get. Okay? Now this looks easy because uh, the pattern there, the sparsity pattern was randomized and fairly uniform. What about if I, if I have big holes like those? Well, then this happens. Okay? I'm not claiming this is uh, the best in painting you can do, but there is no training at all. Okay? Or that is to say the only training you have is the training that occurs while you're fitting this single image. Okay? Right. Now, I'm going to use this for something very, very different. I'm, I'm going to use this for inversion. So this is my architecture. So on the top, I have the network that I want to diagnose. I'm going to use that, slice it, compute a code why not. And then I want, <coughs> excuse me, to get an image X that once I apply the same network to it, gives me a code Y, which is the same. Okay, that's the inversion problem. But I want to use my deep image prior to regularize that. So what I'm going to do is to impose that that image which is being generated is generated through that deep neural network of which I'm going to estimate the parameters. And again, and again this is going to be a pointwise estimate. There is no learning in that orange block there. Okay? So that's going to give my, my inversion machine, if you like. And then by optimizing that on a case-by-case -case basis, I'm going to get a result, which is my inversion result. Okay? Now let's see how this looks when I apply this to diagnosing something like AlexNet. So this is the structure of AlexNet. I simplified it a bit, but all the layers are in there. Okay? And I'm going to start by inverting the first layer. So what does it mean is that I take my input image, the original image on the left, feed it to the network, get the com features, retain only those, and then using this machinery to reconstruct what input image must have been. Okay? If I do this for COM1, I essentially get back my input image. It means that there is no invariance essentially in COM1 per se, at least if you look at all the neurons together, or lo no loss of information at least. Then I go deeper. As I go deeper, you see that my reconstruction becomes blurry and blurrier. Okay? But still, it's pretty detailed and good. And this is true for essentially all the convolutional features. Then when I, want to, when I move to the fully connected layers, well, the fully connected layers intuitively should be less good at preserving spatial information. And, uh, whoops, sorry, I went back. And in fact, this is what happens. So here, at com, uh, fully connected layer number six, you invert that and you get the monkey with three eyes. Okay? You go a bit deeper, it becomes like a, a collage of monkey bits, bits, more bits, more scrambled bits, and then the last layer will get a stain. Okay? Interesting. This is how it looks when you look at the progression altogether. Okay? Now, I want to do something a bit more interesting and show this, how this works on a video. Um, I don't have the copyright for this, so don't tell the BBC that I stole one of their trailers, please. Um, anyway, so what you see here is the input image on the left, and then inversions from COM5, fully connected layer number six, and fully connected layer number eight. And you see essentially the same behavior, right? The deeper I go into the network, the less and less spatial information is preserved, and the more and more blurry and jittery the result is. Now, the reason why this is jumping so much is because I am doing the reconstruction on a frame-by-frame -frame basis without trying to impose any sort of temporal continuity. So what you see here is that every time I sample a new frame, then that lands on a different optimum, a different point in my inversion space. So by looking at how much that changes, that gives you an idea right away of how much invariance there is in the network. Because those all images I've been flashing there, they are the same from the viewpoint of the network. Okay? Now one thing which is the first time I've seen it, I couldn't quite believe it because it doesn't make any much sense intuitively, is that if you invert fully connected layer number eight, you still get a trace of what the input image actually is. You can definitely see that because the image is changing in a way that is pretty close to what you see on the left. Now this is very hard to understand because in theory, fully connected layer number eight, the output of that is a thousand dimensional class probability vector, okay? This should not know anymore what the image looks like, but it does. So is the code semantic or is the code visual? I think it's a mix of both. And even if you go very, very deep down into your architecture, you still get a lot of visual information in those thousand numbers. Although they should only be class probabilities. So that's quite interesting. What else can I do? Well, this is about inversion. I can use the same framework to do instead activation maximization. What this means is that I'm gonna look for, a, for an input to the network which makes a neuron fire up a lot. And in particular, I'm going to focus again on the last layer because that's one of the most interesting. And I'm going to see what happens if I use my framework, my deep image prior, to come up with an input stimuli, stimuli there that maximizes the response to that neuron. 
And to do that, I'm actually going to show you a little demo, or in fact, a little game um, with the recently designed. It's not a very fancy game, but nevertheless. <coughs> um, how do we switch off mirroring? Yeah, or on. All right, so that's that. Here you have it, okay? So, uh, fortunately, the projector is not extremely good, but you can still see, sort of see some traces of these inversions, or this, in fact, maximization. And so the question there is, can you find on this, out of these eight options, the planetarium? Two. Yeah, you got that right. Okay, let's go to the next batch. All right. Bow. Two. Yeah, that was good. I couldn't have guessed. Well done. <laughs> abaya. What the hell is an abaya? I have no idea. <laughs> no one? Uh, yeah? Five. Five. Okay. Yeah, good. What, what is it? Okay, thank you. There you go. This is, a, by the way, the thousand uh, ImageNet classes. All right, so there are a lot of things which are pretty, like, for example, Affen, yeah? Anyone knows what an Affen pinch there is and can identify it here? Four, okay. Nope, that's a boa bo constrictor. Well, you can see it there. Probably some sort of kind of a dog, I guess. All right. Guacamole. Uh, six? Yeah, okay. And you can go on, on, on like this forever. And uh, typically, you can get maybe 80 to 90 of them, percent of them right quite easily. Okay? So although they look like gibberish, actually, somehow, they're they are capturing the essence of the images. Okay? I want to show you, and I would like also to drive home another point, not only that these are actually interpretable, so that it means that the information is somewhere in the network, but that the network, it's, so what, what I'm showing here it's not just an heuristic, it's actually meaningful. Let's see. If I try to run this on live here, let's see what this works. Yeah, okay, that's me. This is running Google Net, I think. So what I'm gonna show it is some of the images I have on my iPad. Uh, this is actually my slides. Uh, how they go? Yeah, I don't want to draw from this one. Okay. So, Lux one, okay? And uh, this is in fact the Lux one, okay? Goose, uh -huh. cheeseburger, yeah. Cup, coffee, coffee mug, okay, so we can sort them. Tree frog, okay? And uh, last one, vending machine, okay? All right, so what, what is the point of showing you this, except the fact that I can run uh, Google Net in MATLAB, which is insane. <laughs> no, jokes aside, MATLAB is still a good tool, um, although it's not popular anymore, I guess, in a certain community. Um, anyway, so what I wanted to drive home here is that, um, if I can go back to my slides, somehow, yep, okay. Close MATLAB just in case. Right. Okay. So these images that they've shown here, right? So this body, body stimuli, these are not just random images, just not heuristics. These are actually images which cause the network to compute that exact features at some point down the architecture. It means that all these images are identical f to actually the true ones from the perspective of the network. Okay? So this shows that networks. Yes, they know a lot, but they don't know everything because, of course, no human would, would think that this is an actual vending machine. So we know a lot more than a deep network. Here's a reading list if you're interested. There is a lot of work um, in, uh, in this area uh, by many, many people, and there is no way I can uh, make justice of this here. There's another thing, however, I would, uh, the, that I would like to discuss, and that's, well, the importance of this prior that I've been using to do the inversion. So here you see two kinds of visualization uh, Compared, on the top we have this deep, deep image prior, on the bottom we have the simple TV norm. So you see that there is a drop in quality if I use the TV norm prior, but you can still, still sort of see the same kind of signal in, in, in the reconstructions. Can I do better? Well, yes, of course I can. So this is uh, what I showed you so far. But another thing that is quite popular in the literature is to do this. So what you do is you learn a conditional deep generator network 
that takes as input y, the code you want to invert, and spits out in a single feedforward pass that is very, very fast, it's not an iterative process anymore, the inversion directly into one go. Okay? Well, that seems like a good idea. How do we train this? Well, we train it in order to minimize the reconstruction error, the L2 error that you get there, by training this deep generator on a sample set of images, for example, on the entire image net. Okay? So I'm training my inverter on image net. And then I can go wild, and I can use a lot of tricks and uh, good ideas to make the quality of this generator better and better. So I can use a perception loss instead of the L2 loss. I can, get an, I can try to guarantee that the um, inversion is still uh, well preserved, or well satisfied as a constraint. I can use a GAN loss to make the images look more realistic and sharper. And these are all good, uh, these are all good things that are gonna make your prior very, very strong, okay? And now, let's, comp let's see what, what is the effect of that. So if I use my deep image prior and I invert to the class of volcano, I get that. Okay, that's a volcano. If I use this plug and play generator network, which is possibly the most advanced of this family of method at present, unless there is something better at the CVR, well then I get that. Well, that looks definitely much better. But at the end of the day, what I could do is just uh, take a billion images on the internet, look for the network or the image that maximizes my volcano neuron, and then maybe I get something like that instead. So is that even better than the plug and play generator network? So these are three different kinds of prior we're using to diagnose for diagnosis. And uh, you know, in order of image quality, of course, that's, that's the way they go. The first one, however, is using this uh, generator network structures prior. The second one is using a GAN, say, learned from uh, ImageNet. The third one is using, say, just uh, a validation set of ImageNet. So it's an empirical distribution. So the, the more we go from left to right, the better uh, the image looks, but the more we are looking at the prior as opposed to the, man, the network we want to diagnose. Okay? This is actually very important because if my goal is to understand how much information there is in AlexNet, I don't really care about PX too much. And if PX is really very, very strong, for example, is trained on ImageNet as a very good GAN generator, then maybe what I can show is that the GAN generator works very well, but that doesn't necessarily tell me how much information there is in the network that they want, in the code that they want to diagnose. So there's a trade-off between how much information put in your prior, how good and interpretable the images you get, and how much of that actually tells you about the model that you want to probe. There is also a very cool website, also by Distill. Distill was mentioned in the talk before. Uh, they're doing a credible work, I think. Um, and they, there is a very recent um, work there where they have a very nice interface where they built many, many of these techniques. Well, not the deep image right in particular, but about others. And then you can have fun browsing, browsing um, a network layer by layer and neuron by neuron, essentially. All right, so that's all for the first part. So second part, attribution. So what is that? Well, we have seen a lot of it already this morning. So I think I might be able to go a little faster. But the problem is this. So we have a network, say the network recognizes a dog in there, and the question we want to answer is, okay, what is the network looking at? Is this a dog? Yes, maybe. Or is that a dog? Who knows? Well, of course, if you train a network on ImageNet, probably this, the answer is the second, but in principle, it could also be the first because they're two valid concepts of dogs. And in practice, what is actually interesting is to see whether the network is looking for any artifact, something which is correlated with the class dog, but it isn't, and of the dog, which parts of the dog is actually looking for, is looking at the face or is looking at the body, those sort of things. Okay, so we want to impute to a different, to a specific portion of the image, the responsibility for causing the network to output a certain estimate of the content of the image. So how can we do that? First, first, first thing first, a simple method, which is just back propagation. So how do we do this? Take AlexNet, feed your image through. At the end, you're gonna get a class, a neuron, say, Black Widow, which is the content of the image, and then I just run back propagation throughout my network until I get to back to the pixels, and then I get a gradient there. So what is the meaning of doing that? Well, that is just doing essentially sensitivity analysis. I take a neuron, which is just a scalar output, and I check what is the gradient of that neuron with respect to its small changes of the input image. And what you see is that if you do that, usually the pixels where the object is located are light up, okay? I think this was the baseline method um, that uh, was not even introduced by us, but we were uh, among the first to propose it for modern deep networks. And then it was 
um, essentially built around in many ways. So we're going to see a few of those. I'd like to say maybe contemporary, so together with us, also deconvolution by Zillard and Fergus uh, is also very related, um, and we're going to see how exactly in the slide. So saliency through backpropagation has, in fact, many variants. This, the one that I just showed you is the one in the middle, simple backpropagation, then we have deconvolution, and we have guided backprop. Now, the interesting thing about those is that they're essentially the same, except minor, minor differences. So that's your network going forward. And so all these saliency methods, basically they come up with a way of inverting those layers, okay? So that you can propagate information backward. So in the case of deconvnet, you, you see that the convolutional layer, they take that uh, uh, <coughs> suffix there, BP, which stands for back propagation. That is exactly the definition of conv that you would get if you were to apply the back propagation algorithm to, to train the network, okay? But when you go to inverting ReLU, instead of, doing, of getting ReLU BP, you just get ReLU itself. This is what a decomponent is, essentially. If you do gradient, then all the layers are inverted in the backpropagation way, okay? And if you do gradient backprop, well, it's a mix of the two. So you get both ReLU BP as well as ReLU together. You do that, and the results look actually quite different. So this doesn't look very good for, de for decomponents because it's a deep layer in AlexNet. Uh, it would work much better for uh, shallower layers. But you see there that uh, it gives you, you can see some sharp edges, but it's, it's a bit confusing, essentially. The gradient tends to light up the object, although uh, this color, colorized version uh, doesn't show it very clearly, but it's very blurry. And guided backflop somehow gets the best of both worlds, okay? If you want to see a comparison and discussion, formal discussion of all these things, you can see our paper in ECCV uh, two years ago. Okay, that's all well and good, but are there, are there limitations of these methods? Yes. And uh, maybe the most offending feature or lack of feature is this one. These methods are not capable of uh, separating uh, different channels. So if you take, say, the bar neuron there, you get that as saliency. If you get a random neuron in a fully connected layer number eight, then you get the same saliency. And if you get the neuron which is minimally activated, well, you get the same saliency again. All right, so that means that we cannot use this method or these saliency techniques to discriminate between different neurons, okay? At least not uh, through different channels. Maybe spatially it works better, okay? So that's bad. What can we do about it? Well, this is one thing we can do, GradCam. So GradCam is based on a very simple intuition, but okay, it works. And the idea is if you do not carry backpropagation down to the pixels, well, then this uh, channel selectivity is actually much, much better. So if you just you know, break it at uh, uh, you know, the first fully connected layer, uh, sorry, the last fully, um, convolution layer there, then you get map that in fact tends to respond well to the class you want to, want to highlight. So this shows that the method is more sensitive to the class type. What else can you do? Well, you can go wild and invent or uh, come up with many, many different rules. Uh, a talk this morning uh, went through many of them. Uh, the talk was about layer-wise relevance propagation. There is another related method which is called excitation backpropagation that came out uh, a bit later, I think. Um, and uh, essentially what it means is that you can take your convolutional and nonlinear non -linear layers and then you can, can essentially design formulas to propagate information backward. Now, a simple example, but that's just a very special case which can fit on one slide, is that you multiply your activation forward with your gradient backward, okay? So that's one example of what you can put in that box. But if you look at the paper, okay, this is actually so also important, you see that many, many other rules have been proposed which are more sophisticated and in practice they work much better, okay? So please refer to the paper and to the tutorial this morning to know more about this. But in essence, what happens here is that I come up with some sort of a rule that take my information and move it from the end of the network back to the input. And there are many ways of doing that. So which one is best? But one thing I could be looking for is how good looking is the image. So i show you an example before. So, you know, the convolution sharp but uniform, gradient blurry but focused, and getting by propagation somehow the better uh, of both. Okay, or the combination of both. Well, yes, it looks good, but this is maybe not uh, the sort of criterion you want to use. Here's another one. So we want to see whether the maps we get are semantically correlated. It means if I compute saliency, do I get something which uh, lights up my object in the image or not? And if it does, 
what do we learn? Well, if it does, it means that A, the CNC method is doing something, it's not just producing noise, and B, the network you are diagnosing, obviously, is somehow localizing those objects. And that's actually interesting because if you train a network for classification, you never show it explicitly the location of an object in an image. So this is something which is trained in a sort of uh, unsupervised manner or weakly supervised manner, if you like. Okay? The problem is that if, it doesn't, if this doesn't work, well, maybe the fault is not of the network. Maybe the fault is, the, is, the, is of the heuristic you have used for inversion. How do you know? You cannot know. Now, the problem is that a lot of these rules that I explained, they do not have a clear f formal foundation, so they are useful in practice, but they cannot be justified formally from end to end. The one exception, maybe, is in fact gradient, because gradient is not just computing, well, the gradient of the map. And that's just a lo lo local linear approximation of what your function actually is. But all the other methods, they use maybe very smart and very useful heuristics, but it's not easy to, to explain formally what they're actually doing. Can we do something else? Well, yes, and uh, so this is what we did last year with this concept of meaningful per perturbation analysis. So here, the idea is gonna be similar, but also different in, a, some, in an important way. So we're gonna take a network which, uh, which uh, we want to diagnose, map the input to a code, and then we're gonna apply a perturbation to the input image. Now this perturbation in the case of gradient is a small epsilon um, variation, if you like, of the vector, the input vector. But that could also be something very different, and we're gonna show a few examples in a minute. Most importantly, it has to be meaningful. What I mean by meaningful, I mean interpre interpretable, because from that, we're gonna get some insight about the behavior or the properties of the network. For example, pi could be injecting noise, that's similar to saliency. I could rotate or translate the image or scale it, or I could erase part of the image. Then I'm gonna look at what is the effect of these changes in the input image onto my output code, and uh, the representation, the code which is being computed can be either be invariant because it's insensitive to that, to that change, or it could be equivariant. That means it's gonna change in a way which is predictable with your input transformation. For example, if you rotate the input image, maybe that corresponds to doing something very specific to your output code. And we have done quite a bit of work on studying exactly this problem, okay? The type of analysis you can do may be local in both X and, uh, and perturbation in the image, or maybe you can go for a per distribution over images and fix the per perturbation or do perturbation, uh, distribution of perturbations, fix the image. All these things are possible. I'm gonna show you just one example here. So I'm going to use this framework to come up with a different way or different approach to saliency. So here's my image, cat probability is one. Now I'm going to delete that cat and see what happens. Is this a good idea? No, why not? Because I just painted the cat black, but the silhouette of the cat is still quite recognizable, okay? So, First thing, the first take home message here is that if you want to perturb your image to study the behavior of the network, that's actually tricky because perturbations are not so easy to design. Even deleting a bit of the image, if you don't pay attention how you do it, you might do something very, very silly like that. Much better result is obtained if you carefully smooth it out. But saying what carefully means is not so trivial, all right? Okay, but with this caveat, what I can do is now I can set up an optimization problem in which I can optimi I optimize over a mask. The mask is gonna cause my image to blur in that region, okay? And now I'm going to find, again using SGD, the mask which is the smallest, which is still causes my cut probability to go from one to zero. And I optimize that, okay? So, that the, 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 so this defines what the silicy really is. It's just something that you apply to your image and cause that neuron to go from one to zero. So it's very well defined. If you do it, and you know, we said that you need to pay attention how you do it, even that is not enough. Because networks are actually very sensitive to adversarial perturbations or examples. So what do we mean by that? Um, so if you try and apply this in a sort of a vanilla way, then uh, <clears throat> what you're gonna get is some artifact like that. So the network is essentially painting. In this case, they're not uh, uh, erasing by blurring, but they're erasing to mapping the contents of the image to zero, so it's a bit more adversarial than what you have just seen before, but just to illustrate the problem. So what happens is that this elision method is gonna paint some patterns that cause the network to just change its uh, interpretation of the image by exploiting some artifact 
of the representation. At the Ethereum network are plenty of artifacts, okay? So, but this is interesting to know that, but this is not telling you what is the behavior of the network on the perturbations which are actually likely to occur in nature. So how can we guarantee that? Well, essentially through more regularization. So we're gonna sample a set of lesions which are actually likely, and therefore they're not too conditioned on or too likely to pick out on artifacts of the deep neural network. So if you do that, these are some examples of what you can get. Okay, they look sharp. Um, I don't know that they're more informative than what you can get with alternative, alternative saliency approaches, but at least what you know is that there is a specific, uh, well, a very well-defined definition of what that mask actually is. It's a mask that is gonna you know, smooth your image in such a way that the class probability score goes down and that mask is as small as possible subject to some regularization. And uh, you can use it, uh, as you've seen uh, quite a bit before, especially this morning, to identify that in some cases the network is gonna recognize your object not because it's picking out on the object, which is truly um, what you want to recognize, but because of some collateral side effect. So in this case, on the top there, you want to identify hot chocolate, but somehow the network likes the spoon instead. And there you want to identify truck, but somehow it likes the license plate, which would be the same if, if that was a bus or if that was a car, say. One last note about uh, CN fragility. So this is a very well-known uh, paper that came out already in 2013, so quite a few years ago. Turns out that if you take an input image like that, you can add an infinitesimal amount of noise, which is not visible to a human, and then you can change the classification from, say, trombone to person cat. Okay, that's quite worrying, perhaps. Uh, and so there's quite a bit of a community around this problem and how to make the network robust to these sort of attacks. Here's two very cool examples. So there's still glasses over there. So you wear these glasses which have a pattern which has been computed. And then yeah, you can look like this person from the, from the point of a network. Or that's even possibly more serious. Stop sign, you put some stickers on it. And now the network thinks this is a speed limit 45 miles. Bad. Okay, so we can apply our perturbation analysis to this to see what is the trombone saliency and the person cut saliency. And now you do really definitely see a very, very different pattern coming out. So we built a classifier that by looking at how those saliency look like can determine whether the image was uh, you know, adversarially attacked or not. And actually it turn out, turns out you can do pretty well at detecting some simple attacks like that. This is solely for illustration purposes though. I'm not recommending you actually do that in, in a company. Okay, this is not robust enough. But at least it's showing some of the properties of this perturbation analysis. Okay. How much time do we have left? Sorry, I lost track. Five minutes, okay. All right, <clears throat> what else can you do? Well, as I said before, you can look at uh, what happens when you perturb an image by applying, say, a homography or deformation like a rotation or scale change. And you might want to know how the code changes in response to that. This is what we call equivariance. Short answer is that for most transformation that you might think of applying to an image, then there is a corresponding simple transformation in code space as well. And we have a pretty extensive study of that in uh, CVPR and IGCV. Here's another very interesting question. Suppose I train AlexNet, then I go there and train VGG very deep, train it from two different random seeds, well in this case it wouldn't really matter because these are two different networks anyway. Do I learn the same thing or not? Are these two representations equivalent or not? Well it turns out you can answer that by looking at whether you can take say the first half of AlexNet, slapped it, slapped it on top, uh, well, at the bottom of uh, VGG very deep and see whether you can still perform classification up to some ad adaptation of the feature. So this, yeah, are these two features the same or not? Well, they tend to be very similar, but not always. And we have, an, again, an extensive amount of, of investigation of that on this uh, IGCB and CPR paper. So equivalence. Okay. So there is no time to go through semantic identification, so I'm gonna skip over that, and I'm gonna just go, go, and come, go and come to my conclusions. But if you're interested, the slides will be made available, okay? This, by the way, is very, very related to, why, uh, to what Boulay was uh, explaining before, so you're not missing much. Okay. All right. So these are the three things, in fact two, that I presented. The third you can read by yourself. Uh, really iconic examples and attribution. <coughs> and so, what is the summary here? Well, I guess with uh, inversions uh, or generating iconic examples, 
you can get a glimpse of what information is being learned by deep networks, by deep network, and see whether, for example, when you learn a bird class, then the network knows about the details, the visual details of um, a bird appearance or not. And that can, can tell you a little bit of intuition on that. Attribution, well, that can uh, tell you which parts of an image are responsible for a network decision. That's also quite interesting, uh, can be used to pick out on whether the network is actually classifying based on some spurious information instead of the genuine signal you want to the network to focus on. And uh, there is a lot of work there as well. Um, <clears throat> I think maybe uh, one interesting point is that uh, you know, heuristic gets you only so far, then if you, I think it would be very, very good to keep developing also methods that can be formally explained from start to finish. Semantic identification, you have seen a lot of uh, uh, this uh, in Bolle's talk just before mine. <clears throat> As um, what I was saying, one interesting question is whether these representations are concentrated or distributed. I think they're somewhere in between. There is a very good argument about that, which I didn't have the time to make, but suppose you have in your word a thousand, um, yeah, so a million different visual concepts you want to learn. Now, a deep feature computed by CVG very deep might have 512 channels. So you have 512 channels and you want to code you know, hundred thousands of different concepts. Of course, it cannot be completely, um, yeah, and there has to be some, some level of distribution because you have to use combinations to be able to map uh, all these concepts, okay? And then <coughs> uh, one thing I couldn't really go into details, but if you're interested, you, I invite you to look at. When a network has learned to recognize a concept from images, it might start to form in its representation a model of the abstract concept itself. For example, if you train a network on ImageNet, it might start to think in general how different words in ImageNet relate. So is a dog similar to a cat in general as opposed to on an image main image basis? And there are, the, there are techniques that allow you to explore and probe that question as well. Okay, that's all. If there are any quick questions, I might be able to answer. Maybe one question coming. Yep. <clears throat> Sorry, th this might be rather naive, um, but since you mentioned uh, this notion that uh, the gradients are kind of, uh, you know, mathematically solid in the sense that it tells you what is the local structure. Uh, yeah. uh, so based on that, is it possible to, let's say, do PCA or something on the gradients that come back to get uh, some sense uh, of what way the network wants to head? Uh, well, uh, okay, so first of all, the gradients, the way we use them so far is on a per image basis. So we get one gradient out of one image. Okay. But we could indeed uh, try to come up, do a, some sort of gradient analysis by running that method on a class of images, or oh, sorry, on a set of images. And then that would make sense, I think. Yes. Okay. Hi, uh, th th this was a highly informative talk that I enjoyed a lot. Uh, I just w w wanted to ask you this qu question, which you may not be able to answer. But you know, are, what what would be the applications of this interpretability? You know, we are still not all the way there in terms of saying yeah. exactly why a particular picture was a cat or a dog or whatever. No, uh, it's a it's a voyage. So uh, maybe I failed to say this, but I think. The field here is just in its infancy. By the way, you see some images flashing there because they didn't finish computing. Uh, this takes quite a bit. Um, so, um, right. So uh, we can get glimpses at the moment, and we are. It's a hard, hard, hard work. So we can get some notions of uh, what might not be working in a network. For example, I was very surprised by learning that codes are visual until the very end, and I think that's maybe it goes along in the way of exp might suggest. Must just something of why the network can actually train anything, because this information, the visual information, is spread throughout. So that's an interesting insight. But it's just an insight, as um, as we were saying before, with the case of Disney, these are these, use, these things are more useful at the moment to generate hypotheses on how things might work or might be changed in order to improve them. But they do not provide a final answer per se. So they cannot use this for verification or to show that your network is uh, uh, good enough for self-driving, for, for instance. True. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Uh, thank you for uh, the magnificent results that you have here and the talk. Uh, I wanted to see that have you uh, tried, so because this uh, structure of the network is such a strong, uh, it seems that it's a, such a strong prior for natural images, have you tried uh, residual networks or dense nets, uh, intermediate representations, and what have you seen any interesting results on those? In terms of the representation you want to diagnose or the representation we want to use for as a prior? Uh, when you use um, a network as your prior and then yes. inverted at an intermediate, this one, yeah, this work. So this network here, phi, or the, the prior there? Uh, both of them. Actually. Both of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have done, uh, definitely we have done visualization of VGG very deep. And uh, I don't recall whether we have done it with the RSNet, um, but probably at some point. And you can find them in the paper. Okay, so the results actually do change. So you can use this to illustrate a few differences between different networks. And if there had been more time, I would have shown some. Uh, in terms of the deep image prior, actually it turns out that if you use a smaller network, it works better. So this rapidly becomes ineffective if the network is too big. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, uh, there is one slide uh, that you said the two networks, AlexNet and VGG, and they're the, the one lay, the corresponding layer, they learn the same representations. So how do you know they learn, they learn the same representations? Is it a one-to-one -one corresponding that this, this neuron to that neuron? If it's not, how do you, how do you know that it's the same? If, if it's, it's not uh, the same, yeah. uh, then which is, how do, you, how do you know which, which representation is better? Okay, so first of all, they're not exactly the same, otherwise the, the two networks would work uh, just as well, and we know that VGG very deep is better, and ResNet is better than VGG very deep, and so on. Uh, now, going back to your first question, so the features are not compatible directly. The reason is that uh, these networks are randomly initialized, so if, na if anything else, the ordering of the neuron is arbitrary. Even if you were to train the same you know, uh, neural, neural activation functions, the order of them is not the same. So at least, at the very least, you need a permutation. In practice, we learn a single linear map between uh, the two layers. So this you still have to train. But now, if you can train that successfully, it means that, <coughs> uh, for example, the information which is computed by AlexNet up to, say, COM4, can be used very effectively by the rest of EGG very deep to a point where the classification performance is similar. Actually, is this true or not? Uh, well, it depends. Usually what turns out to be the case, and it's actually quite intuitive, if you take a big model, you can take those features and make them, um, and make them uh, usable by a uh, you know, simpler model. But the other way around is actually harder. So if you take AlexNet, you get a drop in performance if you replace the couple, first couple of features into VGG very deep, all right? Because AlexNet is less powerful. But it doesn't crash completely. Maybe you lose maybe 5%, something like that. So it means that uh, although they're not equivalent, they are very, they, are, they overlap a lot. So next question, uh, yeah. the two representations, how do you say which is, which representation or which, which is better, which net is better? Can you, can you tell that from only? Not, uh, well, I mean, I, no, actually, it's even hard. Uh, so uh, with AlexNet, usually you get inter visualization which are actually easier to, to parse than with VGG very deep sometimes. Somehow AlexNet is more visual, whatever that means. Uh, but in, ter in terms of super in classification performance, we know that VGG very deep is better. So no, I wouldn't say that there is a sort of monotonic correspondence between how easily things are interpretable and how well they perform. At least not in my experience. Um, thank you for the great talk. Uh, my, uh, I wanted to confirm if you mentioned that by doing attribution analysis, can you identify if an image was adversely attacked? Uh, you can for simple attacks. Okay, so this is more like an illustration of uh, what perturbation might be used for. I would not go to the point of claiming that that's a robust way of identifying perturbations, uh, attacks. In particular, you can design an attack that probably is likely to fool that. But there is some uh, hope by doing attribution analysis that you can find. Yeah, 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 there is some evidence. Yeah, so we, we, we have done it. So that slide was comparing different methods to, to pull this out. Uh, where was that? Again, this is just illustrative, but 
is so that graph there shows that uh, if you use um, uh, if you look at this the saliency maps there, and you can try to classify those into attacked or not attacked, then if you use our perturbation analysis, you get a higher recognition rate for these attacks. But so, you know, that's 95%. I think chance here is 50%, so it's okay. But again, I guess for attack defense, you want to go 99.9999%, okay? Thank you. Um, I was wondering um, for the like the last slide you had with uh, the frame by frame reconstruction of like the turtle, um, is there a way to impose uh, frame continuity so that it's not as flat? Yes, uh, it wouldn't be hard actually. So what all you need to do is to so each time you generate an image like this, you start from scratch. Okay, if you don't want to get these jumps, you just initialize mm -hmm. the next frame with the previous one. Okay. Yeah. But then you would also uh, be subject to like uh, drift over time, right? Well, you would hope so, otherwise you wouldn't see a movie anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has to change and still adapt to the next frame. Okay? Yep. But this is gonna give you some sort of smoothness. But the point here is not to get something which looks pretty, is to get something which looks informative. And the more jitter there is, the more you know that the representation is invariant. So the jitter here is actually a good thing because it's showing something interesting about the representation. Mm. So I wouldn't like, I mean, I could have done it, mm -hmm. but I, it would give me a better image or better video, but it would not give me something which is more informative. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, all right, that's the uh, end of the talk. Oh. Uh, one more question. One, one more question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, sure. No, 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 no problem. Um, can you go back to slides 59? Uh, yeah. Uh, fortunately, it's numbering all my slides. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, that's, um, that's something I learned from my uh, PhD advisor, which got all... Was no, 59. Still very, get very upset when I didn't do that. So, there you have it. Yeah, this one. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not familiar with this topic. So, uh, for my understanding, the input is a final prediction, the vector, and then you can predict the... the the salient map with spatial information. Uh, how do you do that? Okay, so this is extremely simple. So you have to think of uh, phi as a function that goes from the image onto your Black Widow score. Okay, the score is just a scalar. Uh -huh. So it's a function that takes as input an image, which is a big vector, and as output gives you a number, okay, which is a score, how strong this image looks like a Black Widow. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's just a function which goes from an image, a vector, onto a scalar, and then all, that thing is doing, although it looks complicated, is computing the gradient of that scalar with respect to the input image. The gradient means the derivative, okay? That is to say, um, think of taking the input image, perturbing it a little bit, pixel by pixel, and seeing how much the output changes and, and record that, that gives you that image there. So for the second branch, actually, we still have the input image as an input. Okay, so uh, the second branch, so, you can see it formally just there. So it's the phi is on the bottom and d phi over, over the x is, is at the, sorry, the phi is at the top and d phi over the x is at the bottom. Okay. It's, just a, it's just a derivative in practice if you do it. Uh -huh. You'll see, so you see those uh, gray arrows there? So yeah. I didn't explain what they are, but these are the information which you okay, propagate yeah. from the forward pass to the backward pass when mm -hmm. you compute back propagation. So and that's, that's correct just back here. propagation though. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, thank yep. you. You're welcome. Hey, that's the end of the tutorial. So hope you all enjoy it. So hope to see you next year. <laughs>